In the United States, passing laws was designed to be somewhat complicated, and over time it's become even more complicated through practice. I'm going to lead you through that process piece by piece. The only part I'm really going to gloss over is the committees. Everything else I'm going to explain in great detail. So, most laws will begin as a bill in the House. Any member of the House, which is 435 members strong, any one of those members can place an idea into what they call the hopper. When it's placed in the hopper, think of it like a suggestion box. The Speaker of the House, who is currently John Boehner, will take that idea out of the hopper. Most likely, he will assign a committee to it. Now, it's going to go through several committees in the House. I'm not going to explain all of them, but I'm going to tell you this much. If it gets held up in a committee for too long, and members of the House feel it's just being delayed, they can start what's called a discharge petition. To get a discharge petition, you will need at least 218 signatures, and that happens to be a simple majority. Once those 218 signatures are on the discharge petition, that bill is forced out of committee and onto the floor for debate. Once it's on the floor for debate, every member may have up to one hour to debate it and no more. Now, they can simply yield back their time, they can speak for the entire hour, or they can even give some of their t time to a fellow member of the House. Sometimes when a member of the House is making an important point and runs out of time, another member out of courtesy will yield a little bit of their time to them to let them continue. I've seen this happen with Ron Paul many times back when he used to be in the House. So, when you get up there to debate, think about this. If you're in favor of the bill, and you already know that you have the votes to pass it, you're most likely just going to yield back your time because you can't wait to vote on it. But, if you're against the bill, and the votes are there to pass it, you're most likely going to speak for the entire hour. You might spend the hour talking about all the reasons you hate the bill. If everything has already been said, however, and everyone's just obstinate, most likely you will use that hour to just eat up time. You might talk about the bill, you might talk about the Tea Party rally you went to the other day, or maybe the Occupy Wall Street rally. Uh, maybe you'll talk about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ, perhaps. But once your hour is over, the Speaker of the House then bangs his gavel and says, your time is up. If you try to open your mouth again, he'll bang his gavel again, your time is up. So that means you need to sit down. Once everyone has had their opportunity to speak, it comes to a vote. And in the House, all you need is a simple majority, but ties fail in the House. There are 435 members, so if one of them simply doesn't vote, and it's 217 versus 217, it fails. You need a majority. But if everyone votes and it gets at least 218, then it passes, and it goes to the Senate. So in the Senate, any member of the Senate can propose a bill, and sometimes they do. Typically, a member of the Senate, if they want to propose a bill, they take the floor and they simply present it to the Senate. Now, usually bills start in the House, and the Senate will typically write a slightly different version than the one in the House, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. But once they start debating a bill in the Senate, um, if it started there, it will likely go to committees as well. And in the Senate, bills can get tied up in committees indefinitely, and they can die in committees. If it gets out of the committee, however, and onto the floor for debate, there are only 100 senators, so they don't have as many formal rules, and that includes time limits. What that means is that if you are against the bill in the Senate, and you really want to stop it desperately, you might just get up there and start talking and never stop. That's called the filibuster. You just get up there and you go on and on and on. You talk about all the reasons you're against the bill. Then maybe you open up a dictionary and you start reading definitions. Maybe you open up the Bible and you start reading verses. Maybe you open up a phone book, whatever it takes. The longest one-man filibuster in the history of our Senate is held by Strom Thurmond. He filibustered the Civil Rights Act of 1957, and he lasted for 24 hours, 18 minutes before he collapsed. You may remember Senator Rand Paul doing a filibuster, it was, I think, about less than a year ago. Um, he went over 12 hours, and then Obama actually gave in to what he wanted. So sometimes the filibuster actually works. Uh, more recently, Ted Cruz did an unofficial filibuster. Let me explain why it's unofficial. Uh, just to make sure that no single member can hold up the Senate, they passed a rule long ago called the cloture rule. 
Cloture is when you get the votes necessary to end the debate. It's not necessarily a yes vote on the bill, but cloture requires not half, not a simple majority, but 60 senators. So there are 100 and you need 60 senators to get cloture. Well, they had already achieved cloture on this particular bill that Ted Cruz was filibustering, so it wasn't really a filibuster. You see, once you have a cloture vote, that means there are 24 hours left, and Ted Cruz was simply eating up those 24 hours, that is all. He was really just making a statement. It didn't actually accomplish anything. So the filibuster in the past was only used for major bills that certain people just felt would be disastrous if they passed. But they passed a rule in the mid-90s that if a bill is being filibustered, they don't have to stay focused on that bill. They can move on to other things. And when we get to the Bush administration, the Democrats began just filibustering just about anything they didn't like. And rather than actually standing up there and debating, in practice it has sadly turned into this simple procedure where one side will say, we filibuster, and the other side will say, well, let's have a cloture vote. And if they don't get the 60, they simply move on to other things, or they just keep debating it as a group. But you don't have one person up there filibustering indefinitely anymore. So Bush was president. This filibuster was used routinely. And it got so ridiculous that Dick Cheney, the vice president, he spoke of possibly nuking the filibuster. Now, one thing I need to make clear the vice president is also president of the Senate. If there is a tie in the Senate, 50-50, the vice president will vote to break the tie. But he's also in charge of the procedures. And if you want to nuke the filibuster, here's how you do it. Um, a member, in this case, of the Republican Party would make a motion to end the filibuster on the grounds that it is unconstitutional. According to the Constitution, you need a simple majority, and a filibuster 60 is certainly not a simple majority. So he makes the motion, the vice president agrees, the filibuster is stricken down. That kills the filibuster. Uh, the opposition party can appeal it, but if they don't have the votes, their appeal will ultimately fail, and that's the end of the filibuster. It's nuked. Well, there was a threat of doing that when Dick Cheney was president, but some of the moderate Republicans cut a deal with some moderate Democrats. And they decided that the Republicans will not nuke the filibuster if the Democrats promise to only use it for major budget bills. So in 2003, there was a major budget bill, a second round of tax cuts. And many of the Democrats said, okay, this is a budget bill, we're filibustering. And Dick Cheney used another way to get around it. I like to call this the reconciliation maneuver. Now, the way this works is you simply pass a different version in the Senate in order to get the 60 votes you need. Then, because it's different from the House version, it has to go through what's called a reconciliation committee, where they draw up a final draft that's meant to go through both chambers. Well, in that reconciliation committee, if you've got enough members on your side, they just change the bill back to the version you wanted anyway. Just betray those extra senators who were going to filibuster. Well, once it goes through reconciliation, according to the Senate rules, there can be no further debate, which means no filibuster. So Dick Cheney did use this maneuver to pass that second round of tax cuts. Once it passes through the Senate, it then goes to the president, and the president can either sign it or veto it. If he vetoes it, the House and the Senate can overturn him with two-thirds votes each. They need it in the House and the Senate, and it becomes law anyway. Um, that has not happened during Obama's presidency. I don't remember it ever happening when Bush was president. The last one I can remember was Richard Nixon, who vetoed the War Powers Act, and Congress overturned his veto with two-thirds of each chamber. So, I have now led you through the process. It can start in the House or it can start in the Senate, but it must go through both chambers in the same form. Once it does that, it goes to the President, signs or vetoes. If he vetoes it, two-thirds of each chamber can overturn him. I hope you will learn this process well. I know it's long, I know it's complicated, but my students will certainly need it on the exam. And anyone else, if you want to keep up with the policy-making process in Congress and you want to keep up with the news, it's good to understand this process because what I find particularly sad is that since Obama's been president, the filibuster has become so routine at this point that it might as well actually be just part of the normal procedure. 
I have heard people in the media and I have read articles where they quite simply will say, well, the motion failed because it didn't get the 60 necessary to pass through the Senate. Sadly, members are either voting yes or they're voting to filibuster. They're not yielding to the traditional constitutional procedure of there being simply required 50 plus 1. So, I hope this has been informative and I thank you for tuning into my channel.